In this video, we're going to take a look at some key market patterns inside of the S&P 500. If you've been trading the S&P for a while, you've probably already met and encountered these patterns through just your real life trading. If you're new to trading, I think you'll find that this video gives you some key mechanisms to stay on the right side when trading the S&P 500. There's four questions I'm looking to answer through this video. The first is, is there a period of time every single year when stocks tend to outperform? On the flip side, I'm looking to answer when the stocks tend to underperform as well. So we have an idea of what we consider to be positive bullish months and negative bearish months or months in which we expect to see a little bit more of that bearish activity. Now this covers our price activity, but we're still missing a key component and that's volatility. We'll also bring in volatility here, taking a look at which months tend to have higher volatility versus lower volatility. Now the way we're going to go through this exercise is quite simple. I'll start by gathering the data and to gather the data, I'm going to be using our seasonal analysis indicator. This is linked in the description box for free. I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. Once I gather the data, I'm manually transcribing it to Excel. That allows me to then perform some basic analysis here things like mean, average, standard deviation, create some graphs. And once I have those graphs, which is what I'll show you, we can use that to then create a final game plan of how we'd like to trade the S&P 500. Now keep in mind that this is useful for this particular year, and you may want to redo this exercise every year just to have the most up-to-date data. Now here's an example of the chart that I used to gather the data, and you should notice just one indicator loaded on, and that's the seasonal analysis indicator. So you should notice there's three different versions of the seasonal analysis indicator, and if you're a little bit curious, you should be wondering, they're all on the daily time frame. Well, how are these three different? Why are the numbers here different? Well, the numbers are different because we're analyzing different chunks of historical data. So on the far left, I have a five-year historical data chunk. In the middle, I have a 10-year historical data chunk. And finally, on the far right, I use the max available data, which is more than 30 years worth of data inside of the S&P 500. So what this left chart does is it tells us what is the shorter term pattern inside of the S&P 500? What does seasonality look like? We can then overlay the 10 years uh, data to then compare and contrast which patterns still hold true, which patterns are breaking, and then repeat the exercise with the most available data where we have a lot more data points. Now I took all of this data and I translated it into one, I think, just easy to read table. On the left hand side here, we have all 12 months. And with each of the 12 months, I have both the five year win rate along with the five year average return. And this exercise is repeated for the five year, the 10 year and the 20 year. Now, if you're new to this channel, you probably are unfamiliar with the seasonal analysis indicator. So let me explain these terms. Win rate is simply just looking at the number of times in which price closes above where it opened for that month. So say we were looking at the month of February. If our close at the end of Feb was greater than where we opened at the beginning of Feb, that would mean February was a positive month, an up month. And that would be a plus one for this column of win rate. So in essence, we're seeing that for the past five years, the month of January, for example, tends to be an up month about 60% of the time. And the average return, this is the difference between the close minus the open price, is about a positive gain of 0.64%. And this is repeated across the 10 years and the 20 year mark. So if you want to pause this here to take a screenshot, something of that sort, this would be a good slide if you want to do your own analysis. Let me show you how I've broken out the data, and hopefully that helps to make this a little bit more visual, making it easy to see and answer some of the questions we posed. The first question was, which months consistently de uh, deliver positive returns? Now here's a chart of all of the average returns and I've plotted all three uh, data segments, the five year, the 10 year, and the 30 year plus, not the 20 year, excuse me, but the 30 year plus on this chart. Now, if you just take a look visually, it should be quite easy to tell what is the month with the most consistent positive results. It's the one with the greatest histogram. And if you're looking at the month of November, you are correct. November seems to be the best performing month. Now the question is, what is second best? Well, we look for the next highest histogram, 
which is July. And after July, we have uh, the two sections, April and May, which tends to look a little bit more like a tie. So we have these three periods in which we know our returns tend to be a little bit more positive compared to other months. Now, what happens if we're looking at the same chart, but now trying to find the negative months? Well, the same way November stood out, this time September should stand out. It's the worst performing month on this chart. After September, we have February, and after February, we have December. Now, what's interesting about February and December is the patterns that hold true for this five-year are not the same over the five-year, the 15-year, and the 30-year mark. They vary a little bit. You should notice the difference in the histogram here compared to September, where all three are negative compared to even December, where it's just that 10-year that's a little bit more negative compared to the five and the 30-year. So this tells us that we have a little bit more of a mixed bag, but if we did have to choose three months, September, Feb, and December would be the three months, which would be the underperforming months, uh, more negative returns. Now we take a look at which months are consistently up months. Before we were looking at the percentage of numbers on the returns, now we're looking at frequency. How often do we close above where we opened? So here, same idea, we have uh, the 12 months, this time, what I'm looking for is how often do we close above the 60% mark? That tells us more than 60% of the time, this particular month is an up month, meaning it closes above where it opened for the beginning of the month. If you had to rank this, then I think you could see that you have May. That seems to be a fairly solid month in which you have positive winners. July seems to stand out. Both May and July stand out from being consistently up months. November also stands out, which we know November from before, also to be an outperforming month, so we can start to piece that together in our heads. And another month that you might squeeze in is the month of March, where it's our most recent returns, the five-year returns, that are getting this into that positive 60% territory. So we have four months that stand out as consistently up months here. If we had to choose four, March is sort of sneaking in there. Otherwise, we have November, July, and May. Now we take a look at this from a different angle. Now I want to look at this from a volatility standpoint. And to measure volatility, I calculated the standard deviation of the returns that I've plotted for each of these months. And that's what's plotted on this chart, the actual standard deviation for each of the 12 months returns. Now I drew two horizontal lines to give me some sort of boundaries for where I think we might be quote unquote more volatile compared to less volatile. Now for more volatile, that's greater than this 1.4 mark on the standard deviation. And there's three months that stand out. The first is this month of July. The second is the month of September. And third is the month of November. This is the third time that November has now appeared on our list of stocks. So from our most volatile list, we have July, September, November. We flip this upside down looking for least volatile months. And we have April, June and October that stand out. So at this point, what we have gathered is where is there more volatility compared to less volatility? What do the different returns look like per each month? Where do we outperform versus underperform? And we also analyzed frequency. Now let's bring this all together. So we had the positive months as three different sections, November, July, and then we had that April, May period. Negative months, we had September, February, and December. Periods of high volatility, we had September, November, and July. And periods of low volatility, consistently again over the 30 years, April, October, and June. Now we need to take all of these puzzle blocks, all of this information that we've gathered, and create some sort of a game plan here, something that allows us to actually take this information and do something with it. And that's where I have summed it up like this, at least for my particular game plan. I have November, July, and this April, May period as the months in which I would like to be long the S&P 500. I know that those are months in which we have uh, overall positive movements, and these are the months that tend to outperform. Now, what's interesting is if we overlay volatility here, and we use periods of lower volatility as our periods of that accumulation period, when we want to be building up into this position, anticipating the move that is to come. So October here overlays really nicely as a period of low volatility, really foreshadowing that strongest month of the month of November. 
Similarly, June to July foreshadowing that month as a strong month, June with that period of low volatility. And finally, if you were to look at March, that's a period of a little bit more medium volatility. So that is what I used as that period to accumulate your position into April and May. Now for the exit strategy, we're looking to exit into the strength in each of these months. We saw November was the strongest month, so you're looking to exit into that strength. Same idea into July and into the April, May period, you have a two month period in which you're looking at the rally for wherever that strength is to exit. The overall idea is using lower volatility to build up a position into the month in which we know consistently tends to be positive outperforming months, both with volatility and price action analysis built in. I hope you found this video helpful. There was a lot that we covered in this video. If you want to gather the data yourself, I'll leave a link to the seasonal analysis indicator in the description box below. Hope you found this video helpful. Thank you for listening and I'll see you in our next update.